grew up as an only child and a military brat on the snowy hills of upstate New York, and so I know what it means to bundle up for the winter weather. And I can remember some of my fondest childhood memories walking around, rolling in the snow, initiating snow fights. But I knew then, even as a young child, that in order to enjoy these fun-filled snow days, that first there must be storms. One storm that was brewing on the horizon that my childhood self could have never, never have fathomed was the storm of my reality. And it was relentless in its pursuits of destruction in my life. Not too far from my childhood home, I went to school as a nursing student in NYU and in the heart of New York City. But I was also a nursing student in the heart, in the middle, in the epicenter of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. I had also come back from a really exhausting semester. Previously, I had been diagnosed with hypothyroidism that caused me to be extremely fatigued the semester before. And I failed one of my nursing classes, and it put me in jeopardy of failing out of my nursing program. And if that wasn't enough, I had hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. My student insurance, as we all know, isn't that great as far as health. And I just felt like I couldn't get a break. I felt so much pressure to succeed and pass my classes amidst all of this turmoil. Later on, I figured out that the vile clutches of the pandemic were going to do more than me than I ever could imagine. I had lost a very loved grandmother at the time to, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. And then after her, I lost another loved one and another loved one and then another grandmother of other health issues. And I just felt like I couldn't get a break. My only desire at that point in time in my life was to make a trek down to the Brooklyn Bridge and then eventually just inch myself off of it. And then these feelings of grief and turmoil, anxiety and worthlessness, the pressures of trying to succeed, they just overtook me and consumed me. That I hadn't felt like that in a really long time. So these feelings, they were very familiar to me in my body, and they didn't feel great. I had remembered that I did feel like this at one point in time in my life, and it was when I was a really young child. I had met the hands of a nasty abuser, and the abuse continued for some time in my childhood. And I had these feelings of inadequacy, disgust, and anger, and while on the outside I looked like a happy and well-developed child, trauma manifests itself in many different ways, so we know. And one way was in my academic shortcomings. I was a horrible test taker and developed test taking anxiety and I was put into many remedial classes, one being Read 180, that helped with English language arts and test taking strategies. But I can remember repeating over and over to myself that I wasn't worth it, I was never going to be good enough. And I felt the pressure to succeed from everybody else in the world and in my family, including my parents. I remember being 10 and 11 and 12, crying every night and in my bed or at school because I wasn't meeting the expectations that my parents had placed on me. And so one night I Remember, I was consumed with grief and anger and all these negative emotions in middle school, and I just threw my hands up and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done with life. And so I made my way to my mother's medicine cabinet. I don't know what pills they were, but I took the whole bottle, and I laid down in my bed and closed my eyes, hoping that that would be the very last time that I would live on this earth. But when I opened them, the next morning, I understandably had those same feelings of anger, disgust, anxiety, just confusion and pure exhaustion because I thought the tears that I cried in my bed that night before were going to be my last. I went downstairs and I told my mom how I was feeling. I explained to her how I didn't feel like I had a place in the world and I felt pressure to succeed from everybody and I 
felt like I never was going to be good enough. And she told me that everything's going to be okay, the feelings that you are feeling are valid, and a lot of young people in your generation and um, in your age group are going through the same things that you are going through. And as far as the suicidality, she told me that we can get professional help. And so, coupled with the reassurance from my parents and the professional help I received, I was able to get through just my middle school years into high school. But let's fast forward to when I am a newly practicing, new graduate mental health nurse right here at the Johns Hopkins Hospital downtown. I am supposed to be enjoying what it, it's supposed to be the fruits of my labor and the height of my new nursing and professional career. But that is not what I was doing. I was still anxious and traumatized, understand, understandably, from the collective trauma of the pandemic that was downturning. And I had this expectation of what I thought nursing was supposed to be. And then when that expectation was not met, I was very much ready to throw my hands up and leave the field altogether within the first six to nine months. I told my nurse manager at the time, her name is Dr. Patricia Sullivan, hi Dr. Pat, and I told her I was completely done. She slid across her desk to me this resiliency plan, and she told me I want you to be a part of MEPRA over at the School of Nursing with Dr. Rushton. And MEPRA stands for Mindfulness Ethical Practice and Resiliency Academy. And what it did, it carved out a particular time every month for nurses to come in and just find community with each other. We were able to celebrate um, all of our triumphs and then grieve all of our losses from the last two years and going through the pandemic. But really what MEPRA taught me was a way to reshape and rethink the way that I look at resiliency. I was encouraged not to look at it through rose-colored glasses. It wasn't going to be this autopiloted state of peace amidst turmoil. But resiliency is always going to be rooted in the communities that you connect with. And that is what MEPRA did and Dr. Rushton did for me at Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. I was finally able to come to the realization that the isolative nature of the pandemic had convinced me that I was all alone in this fight in life. And the only job in me really hated any sense of dependency on others. But it forced me to realize that community is my only means to survival. Eventually, I found community once again, but it took me quite a bit of time to realize that. I can remember that my first year in high school, I was sitting in my AVID classroom. For all of you who don't know about AVID, it was called Advanced Via Individual Determination, and it was for those who were at risk of not reaching the goal of going to college. Coach Beatty was my AVID teacher, and she told me that I could achieve anything that I wanted to, that I had big dreams and big goals, and she was gonna help me achieve them. I was in a classroom amidst other students that had some academic failings, some similar or different backgrounds, but we had one goal in mind, and that was to get to college. We would do activities in the classroom, and we would make scrapbooks and talk about our goals, and put the goals in the scrapbooks about three years or five years or 10 years on down the line. What Abby did for me was get me through high school and help me enjoy it a little bit more. But it really ingrained a sense that I knew that wherever I was going after high school, that I needed to be grounded and rooted in a community that was willing to water me, help me grow, so that I could withstand whatever challenges next that I faced in life. And that's exactly what I did finally when I got to college at Texas State. I found another community that was called Black Women United, or BWU, and it was just a place for black women on my campus to come and take off our capes and just be unapologetically us. I can remember distinctly one um, meeting that we had. We did a uh, activity called Sister Circle, and what it did, we were able to share our shared experiences and just reaffirm and reassure each other that it's okay and we're gonna make it through. I can remember distinctly there was a young woman talking about childhood abuse, and I immediately sprang up and I ran out 
of the room. I found the nearest bathroom and I totally started falling on the floor. Falling so loudly um, that the rest of the e-board members, some of them, they could hear me and they came and found where I was. They came into the restroom and they closed and locked the door behind them and they just sat on the floor and cried with me. They weren't upset that I caused the scene. They just understood at the place that I was and we were able to connect in that way. And so that community also was there for me during a time where police brutality was starting to be on the rise again and our community was, was under attack, where names like Sandra Bland and Eric Garner and Trayvon Martin, their faces were plastered everywhere, and then the black leaders on our campus were even um, getting death threats. So we were able to come together as a community and foster love and cherish each other in those really hard times. And now some of those people are the friends that I call sisters and confidants and my lifetime partners. And just like with BWU, I was able to find another community. Again, back when I was in nursing school, after coming off of a horrible semester where I had health issues and academic failings, I ended up being pulled aside and into the office of my now mentor, Dr. Gillis, who gave me a reality check. She told me, first of all, to stop crying because everything was gonna be okay. But more so, she reassured me that everything was gonna be fine, that I mattered as a person, I mattered as a woman, I mattered as a black woman, and I mattered as a nurse. She told me that my community needs me and people need me out there, and that I have no choice. After that conversation, it led me to joining the Black Student Nurses Association, and they were there for me, not only just to get me through uh, nursing school, but a pandemic that had caused three of the biggest exacerbated injustices that our community had seen in a while, which was police brutality, black maternal mortality, and then the mortality rate for black and brown people who contracted the COVID-19 virus. And so the isolative nature of the pandemic really convinced me that I was all alone in this world, that I was just doing this all by myself, but that was not the case. And just like everybody else in this world, I know trauma and I know strife and I know feelings of inadequacy. But what I know now is that resiliency should always be rooted in community. And that you can go throughout life and times are gonna get really tough. But the, way, the weight and the load that you carry can be lightened by the community and the people that you surround yourself with. And just like I would start to think about my negative experiences and I would start to perceive them as little storms. And just as you would cover yourself up in the wintry weather, every community partnership, every mentorship program or academic program is representative of a layer of clothing on top of me to help shield me and weather the storms of life. In psych nursing, we call them protective factors. And without those factors, this 17, this seven-year-old victimized and academically behind young black girl could have never imagined herself being a clinical professor or a doctoral student or a mental health nurse giving a TED talk at Johns Hopkins. What I really have to attribute, first of all, is thanks to my first community, my family and my friends who stood by me, my loved ones, when just a year ago I had plans again to end my life. And they stayed by my side until I became the Sterling once again that they knew and they loved. I also have to thank all of my teachers, my professors, my coaches, my faith community, and most importantly, as well, my nursing community. For all of these years, seeing the fire in me and continuing to fan that flame. I hope that the woman that I am today is a testament to how you fostered community for me and so many others and gave me the privilege to be possibly somebody else's favorite sweater or coat to help shield them and get them through some of the worst and hardest times in their lives. Thank you so much.